Hi, shall I welcome everybody? We're good to go. Take that is, yes, excellent, excellent. Oh, well, it's lovely for all of us to uh, be here together and thank you for joining us. I'm really excited to hear Lily talk uh, shortly. My name is Sharon Graham Davies. I'm the director of the Herb Feed Centre here at Monash University in Melbourne. And I'm really just amazed at all the events that are happening, um, particularly in Melbourne, but also Victoria uh, and across Australia on this Indonesia space. I'm just thinking of, you know, in the last week, really, we've had incredible things. We've had Monash University have its first week of teaching. Uh, we have had the IEP uh, announcement with some fabulous scholars selected. Uh, for that, we've had a teachers win uh, an innovation teaching award. So on the Indonesia landscape, there's lots of incredible uh, things happening. So it's a really exciting space to be. Now, I'm not going to talk for uh, any longer. I'm going to hand over uh, to Jesse, I think, who's going to uh, take the mantle from here. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Sharon. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the um, 100 people of the Kula Nation who are the traditional custodians of the land I'm living on. And I pay respects to Indigenous elders past, present and emerging from all lands we're meeting. Sovereignty has never been ceding, ceded. Um, I'm, I'm Jesse. I'm the Social Cultural Officer of the Australia Indonesia Youth Association, or AYA. AYA is a non-government, youth-led, non-for-profit, which aims to better connect young Australians and Indonesians to each other and to the Australia-Indonesia related opportunities. I runs uh, regular events, including language exchange, uh, trivia nights, professional networking events, sports events, and seminars like this one. I'm really excited about this event. Uh, this history isn't commonly taught at schools. And I look forward, uh, I hope this event expands our understanding of pre-colonial international relations between Australia and Indonesia. And lastly, I'd like to thank um, PPIA for all their hard work in organizing this event. It's been a pleasure working with you all. I'll hand over to Kevin now for PPIA. Hi all. Um, sorry, you were, uh, Jeffrey's gonna take over for PPIA instead. So Jeffrey, could you give an opening speech? Thank you. Sure. Um, right. Uh, by the way, sorry. Right. So, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Om swastiastu. Namo buddhaya. Shalom dan salam kebajikan. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge the Korean nations for where I'm currently standing at, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge the elders past, present, and future of uh, wherever you, or wherever my audiences are standing at. And yeah, good morning, good evening, and selamat sore to everyone. I'm Jeffrey, the Education Social and Culture Committee of FBA Victoria. That's the Indonesian Student Society of Victoria. And we represent all Indonesian students who are studying in Victoria. Being a person who was born in Australia and raised in Indonesia, both countries are significant to my life. Therefore, I, I have developed a passion of developing stronger bonds between these two countries. Never have I thought the Indonesian culture played such an important role to the Australian Aboriginal community. Growing up in Indonesia, I was never thought about it in PPKN or EPS, that's civics or social studies in Australia. It's not because of Dr. Lili Yulianti, a speaker for today's panel, will I get to learn more about the rich cultural ties between two of my most beloved countries. On behalf of Papaya Victoria, I would also like to thank our moderator, Dr. Sharon Davies, Aya, who we hope we can collaborate again for another extraordinary event. Our media partners, which include Kajere in Melbourne, Papaya Australia, Papaya New South Wales, and Papaya Swinburne, as well as all of you who choose to come here. We hope that you will have a stronger insight 
towards both the Australian and Indonesian cultures by the end of today. Now, I will pass it on to Dr. Sharon Davies, who will moderate today's event. Uh, right. uh, Dr. Davies. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Lily. We first met um, only at the start of this year, actually, in one of the gaps with lockdown um, at Professor Margaret Katomi's house, which I was imagining for some reason to be quite small and informal. And I went there in jeans and a t-shirt. And if anyone's been there, it was a it was a, a very big house. And Lily was there as a friendly face to, to welcome me in. So it was a lovely meeting. Uh, and it's also a really nice connection. I did my PhD in Sulawesi, uh, having been the student of Campbell McKnight, who used to show me photos in the early 90s of his fieldwork. Uh, in Sulawesi and work with three pangas. Uh, so it was always a big image in my uh, imagination of, you know, the possibility of going to Sulawesi. And so it's just lovely that Lily can talk to us uh, today. So she's going to be uh, talking about her research project, which explores first connections between Indonesia and Australia in the 1700s. Uh, uh, Lily is the founder and director of the Makassar International Writers Festival and Rumata Art Space, which she established uh, in 2010 in the hopes of reviving the arts and culture of Makassar and South Sulawesi literary culture. So please put uh, questions into the chat box or private message and we'll get to those uh, at the end. With, but without further ado, silakan, Wulili. Okay, terima kasih, Saren. <laughs> Dan terima kasih undangannya. Um, hello everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam kebajikan, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya. Dan uh, saya ingin mengucapkan terima kasih sekali lagi atas undangannya. Selamat sore, good afternoon everyone. So before I start, uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting uh, today. Uh, I'm here in the uh, on the considered land of Kulin nations um, in Wurundjeri uh, country, uh, and then I pay my respect to the elders, past and present. So. Um, just a brief introduction about myself. I'm a postdoctoral research uh, fellow uh, working for a, a project called Global Encounters, and I'll briefly explain about the projects later on in my presentation. But just um, just a short illustrations about uh, myself. I was born in Makassar, South Sulawesi spending 30 years of my life in Makassar before um, moving into Melbourne back in 2001 <laughs> to study for my uh, master in gender and development studies uh, at the University of Melbourne and uh, my uh, first professional career was uh, as a journalist I worked for uh, Compass Morning Daily Compass uh, one of the leading um, newspaper in Indonesia and as a journalist of course uh, I uh, besides the politics and social affairs I focus on the gender and the reformacy stories uh, back then so that's why I decided to um, to shift my career from the uh, professional into the uh, academy back in 2001 studied under the Australia award uh, scholarship but after this um the scholarship period one thing that i realized that uh there is no um a significant element about understanding the australian history during my study here uh, as a master student uh, at the university and if it's not because the community engagement with um artists uh people from the creative uh, Victoria back then, who keep telling me that, you know, you're from Makassar, and we learn about the history of uh, the, uh, the early context, the pre-colonial context between the indigenous people and Makassar. So it was the first, for the first time, I, I look into the, uh, such a rich material <coughs> in the academic circle, but still, treated as a non-history or a non-story, both in Indonesia and 
in Australia. So uh, as Jeffrey said that we didn't learn about the, the context from our IPS uh, textbook, yeah, uh, history textbook back in Jakarta or other uh, places in Indonesia. It also happened here. It's not only few years back now, uh, the, the school in, in Australia uh, put a, such a great um, educational material about the, uh, the, his, the Australian history and then uh, a lot of uh, children's uh, book stories, songs and other educational activities that looking at this indigenous uh, culture, life and history. So allow me to share my presentation. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about Makassar and Marege to make it simple. Yeah. So Marege is how the Makassan people or Makassaris uh, call the, uh, the northern part of Australia. So they call it Marege. Uh, so people from Marege means that people coming from the uh, from the northern part of Australia, especially the eastern part of um, Anham land. So today I'm going to ask this one particular question yeah, to everyone. So do we have a future? for our shared history when we start this conversation by you know saying that we've never known about this history before so what is like the future of this unknown history or an unfamiliar history for both uh for both countries well it's not working okay so the project that I'm joining now, it's called Global Encounters and the First Nation Peoples, 10,000 Years of Australian History. This project explores encounters between Australia's indigenous peoples and voyagers from the sea over the period of a millennium. So it's a quite ambitious project under the uh, leadership of Professor uh, Lynette Russell. The, um, the chief uh, investigator for this uh, five-year project uh, with Mones Indigenous Study Centers. Um, the project will innovatively reconstruct Australia's role in global explorations, creating a new transdisciplinary intellectual school with the potential to recast Australia's history, national identity, and place in the world impacting ongoing debates over Australia's national identity and the urgent need for reconciliation with our first people. So as uh, you might heard about the Australian history, it's a very, you know, uh, British centric and uh, not, you know, like there is no enough room to explore that what's happening before the, the British arrived this continent now uh because we are still in the lockdown so i'm <laughs> putting this to uh interesting pictures not far from where i'm <laughs> where i live here so this is a picture this is the first picture this is uh, anyone's familiar just drop a comment if you're familiar with these two pictures uh the first one this is actually um, a statistic that uh, that everyone can see or read uh, from the uh, Sandridge Bridge, not far from uh, Crown, yeah. So the Yara uh, Yara River and South Bank. So we've got uh, a glass panel uh, presenting multicultural Australia. So more than one hundred sixty nations. Uh, living in harmony of course in Australia and there's a brief history in numbers uh, so if you look at this uh, glass panel talking about Indonesia so um, the, the statistic uh, mentioned here that most people from Indonesia come from Jakarta 
Surabaya, Java, Sulawesi, and uh, Timor. Yeah, and there's a brief history about the arrivals of Indonesian people. So uh, it's very interesting to look at how in Melbourne uh, and uh, in a multicultural settings. Uh, the, the history been uh, presented as a part of a public information in the city of Melbourne. Uh, does anyone here have seen this panel before? <laughs> oh yes, yeah, Felicia, Jeffrey, yes, I have, yeah. So if you happen to read it carefully, yeah, so they put the 1750 until 1910 uh, as the first rifles of Indonesian people in Australia as temporary seafarers from Makassar or in 1970 uh, was known as Ujung Pandang. And of course, uh, from the 17, sorry, yeah, the 1750 means that we are actually the first visitors in Australia back then, yes, because it's a, it's a, in the 18th century, we, our ancestors already visited the, the continent. And later on, 1880 until uh, one, uh, 1900, there's a pearl divers and can cutters, 1941 to 1945, refugees from Japanese. Uh, this is bit, uh, during the Second World War, and later on in 1948 until 1956, Dutch former residents. Yeah, so I think it's after the independence, and there's still a lot of uh, you know chaotic situations um, following the Indonesian independence. So we've uh, got Dutch uh, former residents, but they all counted as Indonesians or people that come from Indonesia. And in the modern time, from 1970 until today, of course, we've seen uh, students and business migrants. So uh, in terms of numbers, we might small, yeah, of course, compared to uh, other nations. But in terms of history, uh, we have a very special relationships because our ancestors, arrived in Australia in 18th century, according to the, uh, the narratives that built and maintained uh, by Australian uh, government and the city of Melbourne. Uh, and then from the city of Melbourne, yeah, from the CBD, I'd like to check you to Tonbury, not far from Brunswick, not far from Parfield, Melbourne University. Uh, Anyone here have visited Islamic Museum of Australia in Tonbury? So the narrative uh, again is presented that the um, if you look at the history timeline of the Islam in Australia, again the starting point comes from the Makassan Tripangas. Yeah, so this is this two narratives is very uh, interesting for me whenever I share the story about uh, the the early contact between people from Asia, people from Southeast Asia, people from Nusantara with indigenous people in Australia before the 1770. Um, we've got this interesting public information, we've got the very interesting corner that explains the history in one of the uh, museums in, in Melbourne. Uh, but of course, because we are all very busy with our life, this kind of a public presentations, yeah, is, uh, you know, not become a, a common sense, not only for Indonesians living in Australia or in Melbourne, but also for Australians who um, always responds back to us whenever they know that we are from Indonesia. Of course, number one is, oh, you're from Indonesia. Kamu orang Indonesia. Wow, Bali. Saya cinta Bali. Saya suka Bali. And this history 
uh, stays or remains as a uh, unknown history. So what's the reason be behind this contact? This uh, commodity called tripang, yeah? So the contact, contact between people from Makassar and the indigenous communities in the northern coastline of Australia took place for more than 300 years, at least from the 18th century, just like what the glass panel uh, presented as a public information in Melbourne. Um, and the, the connection or the context uh, lasting for uh, 300 years until the early uh, 20th century and have become a focus of academic research for many years from the seminal works of Professor Campbell McKnight. Uh, Ibu Saran mentioned that uh, he, studied, uh, he studied under uh, Campbell McKnight supervisions and this has actually opened some more doors, opened uh, doors for younger researchers to look at, to look at this uh, early context from many aspects. Uh, up until today, there's still a lot of uh, archeological projects uh, to unearth the Makassan sites yeah, in the different part of, not only the Northern part of Australia, but now they're moving into the West, the Western side. Uh, and more and more recent studies investigate the impact of the tripang thread on indigenous communities. So the interaction between the tripangers with Aboriginal people have been associated, of course, not only because of this, uh, commodity. Yeah? The story behind this commodity is quite uh, the fascinating for me because both, Aus both the indigenous Australians and the Makassar or the Makassaris, they don't consume this commodity. Yeah, this, uh, 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 I'll tell you later why the, what's really the, what happened with this, uh, the commodity. So, Tripang or sea cucumber, or also known as Bichet de Mer, is a marine animal found on the shallow seabed of the coast. It's expensive, it's price. If you look at any Asian store here in Melbourne, you might find the frozen one, yeah? Uh, it's called tripang. Uh, and it's a price ingredient in Chinese delicacies, yeah? Tripang was a major item for commerce back then. And there was a period in the 18th century where the, there's a boom, yeah, tripang boom. The demand was so high in China. So that's why merchants, especially from southern part of China, traveling, go, traveling down to southeastern uh, uh, cities, south, southeastern, Southeast Asia to find more and more tripang because the, the the demand was so high back then. And tripang, in fact, was the first Australia's export community. And because of tripang, the trade connections connected China, Nusantara, especially Makassar, uh, in 18th uh, century, in the 18th century, uh, before Dutch took over, VOC and Dutch took over the uh, uh, the region. They were under the uh, Makassar and Goa Sultanates back then. So what's the tripang? What's so special about tripang? So the class Holoturidae contains more than one thousand species. These marine animals live predominantly in tropical waters, such as those to the north of Australia. The lengths range from 10 to 50 centimeters, but sometimes they can grow up to more than a meter, yeah? They also range in color, including black, white, gray, brown, blue, and red. The use of the term tripang theory from Makassar word of taripang or tripang is generally reserved for the edible varieties of sea cucumber. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, stories behind uh, these uh, Chinese delicacies because they think that it's not only because the Chinese the Chinese really love tripang because of the texture, yeah, but also because there is a benefits in terms of health. Uh, 
And the 18th century actually witnessed the Dutch, uh, where although the Dutch had clamped down on the spice trade, yeah, or what we now uh, learn as jalur rempah, and restricted the trading capabilities of other European powers in the 17th century, Makassar, due to its position, continued to witness trade in variety of products, particularly the maritime commodities from the southern and eastern parts of the islands, which now make up Indonesia. This is, of course, included the tripang trade. So if we try to reconstruct or imagine the power relations, yeah, why Dutch not really, the Dutch not really care about, care quote and quote about the tripang because they focus on the, uh, the spice trade back then. Yeah, they really focus uh, to, to dominate the, the spice market and the space the spice routes back then. So this is also one of the explanations why the ordinary people in Makassar, who after the Makassar war, yeah, uh, try to make a new, uh, try to uh, make a new source of livings, found this repang first in a eastern part of Indonesia, and then they explore uh, the other areas in Timor, Papua, uh, near Maluku, and it was back then because they've got this uh, such a well-equipped maritime uh, technology and culture, they're crossing the Arafura Sea and found that there's a lot of tripan in the northern, uh, northern coastal areas of Australia. So uh, if you look at the, the triangle, so here we talk about people coming from southern part of China, uh, traveling to Indonesia or Nura, established their connections and they found that there's a very um, big opportunity for them to open a market. Like they brought a lot of uh, valuable things from China, the southern parts of China, and then establish uh, new connections with the locals and the global communities in uh, living in Makassar back then in the 18th centuries. Uh, and then the Tripangers from, from South Sulawesi establish the um, the tripang route here from port of Makassar to the northern coast uh, coastal areas of Australia. Before they arrived in Marege, so Marege is here. They normally uh, explore the the western part of uh, Kayu Jawa, yeah, Kimberley, but most of the research that uh, been uh, discussed and published, of course, it's mostly coming from this uh, this part of uh, northern northern part of Australia. So it's in uh, Anham land, especially the eastern, the, the northeast Anham land in this part. So this uh, this map explores the uh, the line, yeah, the roads from. South Sulawesi here, if you're following, and this is actually the uh, the commemorative voyages routes that um, try to follow the the ancient routes back in 18th century. So uh, there were two commemorative voyages um, to to celebrate this history, the rich history between Australia and Indonesia. The first called Hati Marege project, uh, initiated by an Australian historian, uh, Peter Spillett from Darwin back in 1988. And the second commemorative project called Nur Al Marege project. So both, both projects uh, build a replica to try to follow the, uh, the ancient roots of this uh, tripang roots from Makassar to um, Marike. 
this this one is uh, this this map is uh, give us a more uh, clear picture so from Sumyang in China, this is just, uh, the southern part of China, the merchants went down to South Sulawesi, uh, arrived in, the, in Makassar, and then the route that established by the Makassan tripangers took the Makassans down here in Marege, as well as, as, well as in Kayu Java. Um, interestingly, uh, although most uh, research, yeah, both um, history, uh, ethnography, uh, linguistic, and of course, archaeology, conducted in this part of uh, northern part of Australia. But as I said before, that nowadays, there are more and more uh, archaeological projects that conducted in, in this part as well. And one of uh, one of our researchers from Monash Indigenous Studies Centers already, uh, you know, already developed another map of Makassan sites in this in this part in this part of uh, uh, Northern Territory. So, in the future, yeah, in the five ten years from now, we'll, we've seen more. Makassan sites and stories and the impacts of Makassans, not uh, only in Marege, but also in Kayu Jawa, in, uh, among Yaninua communities here. Uh, and there's a lot of, I think it's uh, 10 or 8 Makassan sites uh, been identified in this part of uh, Australia. Now, uh, this is the prau, yeah. The the word of prahu uh, adopted into Yonggu Malta or the uh, local language of uh, Yonggu people uh, in Northeast Anham land. And the prau refers to the traditional uh, wooden boat, yeah, with a fairly unique. Uh, sales like this, uh, one or uh, sorry, two or three sales like this. So um, there's a very interesting story behind the, the each commemorative uh, voyage uh, projects because from deciding to build the prow, uh, both the uh, Peter Spillets project and the Yayasan Abu Hanifa or Abu Hanifa Institutions projects follow exactly all the steps that taken by our ancestors in building the prow meaning that they need to get together first in a community and then explaining about their idea to build the prow asking for blessings from uh, the universe uh, from the gods saying that we are planning to build a prow and then following every steps of the traditional rituals <coughs> and the ceremony including to select or to pick a certain uh, type of woods yeah so although there's no more um prau being produced or built in the modern day because i think the last the last padewakang prau was built uh, in early uh, 20th century and if not because of these two commemorative projects initiated from uh, initiated by uh, uh, Australian sites we uh, as Indonesian never seen or never had any opportunity to 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 see the real uh, Padewakang or the real prow that uh, crossing the Arafura Sea from the port of Makassar set sails to Marege so sailing south out of the center fleets of boats called praus visited the coast of northern australia arriving on the northwest monsoons in october and november they built their campsites staying for several months to catch and collect tripang they returned to makassar when the southeast winds blew and Chinese merchants were waiting for them at Port of Makassar, ready to ship the community to the southern ports uh, 
of China. So if today we're talking about the globalizations, uh, bilateral trades, three parties trades and so forth, our ancestors already did that with China and with Australia, indigenous Australians. Contacts between the Tripangers and the indigenous communities ended. Yeah, it ended when the South Australian government banned the Makassans from entering the Australian territory in 1906 and 1907. So, because the, um, the colonizations and the British in New South Wales start to learn about this uh, economy prospect in the northern part of Australia, so they, they sent a delegation, so a mission to learn about what happened in the top end and it was then we we keep referencing to the uh, uh flinders uh ship journals about how these uh people from the news uh, the white people from new south wales witnessing fleets yeah uh dozens of prows coming on regular basis and establish Track connections in Australia. So, despite the increased attention given to Makassar and indigenous people contacts, uh, of course, again, in the academic circle, and we also witness this story has inspired creative experience both for Australian artists and Indonesian artists. The history is still mostly unknown, of course, as uh, we understand that there's no proper collections in, at any Indonesian museums that properly telling us about this uh, history. Uh, the, the history also absent from our textbooks, uh, well, from uh, primary school to higher educations. If, this is just very few um, from our latest uh, focus group discussion with university students in Makassar. We had a, a virtual focus group discussion with 15 uh, students from one of the universities in Makassar asking this very uh, this, uh, simple question about Australia and uh, Indonesia uh, relationships and what actually the, per the perceptions of Australia among the Indonesian students in Makassar. And there's no single answer or response telling us about these uh, connections. So for many uh, young people, especially the uh, university students, Australia is still uh, perceived as a one of the most uh, favorite place to continue your study. Yeah. If you are uh, categorized or identify yourself as uh, scholarship hunters or someone who are, you know, planning to, to continue your study overseas, Australia is always the best, uh, one of the most um, my favorite uh, country uh, for Indonesian students. But when we ask about, do you know any uh, information or so have you heard the stories about the, um, the ancient context between Australia and Indonesia, uh, based on our latest focus group discussion, uh, none of the students actually have heard or listened to or read about this uh, history. So our team conducted um, a baseline study last year. We are revisiting the local museum in Makassar and our obs observations in mid-2020 at Lagaligo Museum Makassar suggested that the history of Tripangers who established the industry left no trace at all in the museum. We did find some information at Makassar City Museum, but the objects uh, were poorly curated. There were several scanned photographs printed in big size papers on the walls without coherent narrative about what was being told from those pieces. Thus, they just provided information 
uh, but did not provide context to our narratives. Uh, unlike the uh, Islamic Museum of Australia in Thornbury, although it's a, just a small museum, but the way they build the narratives about the early context and connect the, the context of uh, Australia as a multicultural country, and with the uh, with the Tripangers played uh, such significant uh, role to connect or to introduce Islam in Australia and setting the connections in a in a context of a global trades uh, could actually fill the gap. Yeah, while the the information or the history was absent in the text uh, our textbooks, at least if you visit the museum, you can learn something about the the prowl the connection between the Makassar, um, people from Makassar and the indigenous Australia. You learn about how Islam is perceived as a history, as a part of Australian history and so forth. But our baseline study back in Indonesia didn't actually provide this narrative. Even under the current project called Project Jalur Rampa, we haven't seen that actually there is a such a or a quite significant element that telling us uh, this story. Uh, by the way, this this replica here in this photo, it's a beautiful photo, uh, still at, uh, unpublished by the uh, project owner. It's called uh, Nur Al Marege because the commemorative project uh, was commissioned or initiated by an Islamic or a Muslim organization in Sydney. So it's not surprise, of course, that they try to build the narrative within this uh, context. Yeah. So Islam was brought by the Tripangers, and it was the Tripangers who actually introduced the religion into Australia. Now, uh, allow me to play this uh, short movie. It's a, it's a long documentary, but I put a clip here uh, to give us, you know, um, to give you some uh, ideas about the history and the connections and how the academics and also people from uh, media industry and creative industry, uh, including Australian artists, been working and produced uh, several uh, projects in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. This is uh, one of uh, my projects with the University of Melbourne, VCA, sponsored by uh, VCA Melbourne Uni uh, back in 2018 and 2019. So it's, uh, it's also a BC yeah, before COVID-19. Many years ago, long before the white man came, an east wind blows, a prow arrives in Marege, men aboard from another land. Standing on the shore watching the prow, a young man, curiosity overrides suspicion. Water, fresh water, asked the men from the sea. Thirst is quenched, trade begins.
what I'm looking forward most about this project is, uh, I guess, reconnecting with with the ancestors um, and joining joining the two cultures and um, finding out more information on, especially the Macassan side of um, things as well. It's really important, I guess, for all of us to learn, I guess, the real story of the Macassans and their connections. It's part of Australian history. It should be taught in schools. Um, and I think that's uh, part of a history that we can't change, but we, we have to educate them about the history of the Macassans. Let's jump in, guys. Jump in. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Gonna cast a movie with these two as the heroes. No. Danny Glover, Denzel <laughs> Washington, no. and over here. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The symposium uh, is about to start, but please be seated. Thank you. When we look at the history of the exchange between the Macassan peoples and in Northern Australia, we start to, again, the story is one of where there was this idea that maybe it just happened once or maybe it just happened a few times or more recently, we start to see that this exchange has been going on for a very long time and for much longer than, uh, than people initially expected. So I've been told that the trade from an academic perspective has been going for about 400 years, but I don't think anyone really knows. I, I, it could have been going thousands and thousands of years. The his brief history about the Macassans is they would come here uh, with the trade winds. They would travel here and with them, they would bring all these um, things that Yolngu had never seen before. So like knives and tobacco and, um, and a lot of many other things, silk and all these amazing things that Yolngu hadn't seen. And they asked the Yolngu, we come here in peace and we want to collect tree paint. So they came and lived amongst the Yolngu people and developed a first trade relationship with the Yolngu, um, which went on for many, many hundreds of years. So, um, and also that's why the Yolngu, they recorded these things um, by art through song, through dance, through painting. Questions for you. So my planning just to skip this part in uh, the bonding. Yeah, I was just saying, Lily, we've only got nine minutes left, and there might be a few questions for you. Sure. Um, so this documentary is now under an exclusive contract with um, SBS Australia. Uh, I think you can watch this on demand because we cannot share this uh, on YouTube right now because we still have a three three years to go. No, no, we we started the last year, so we still have two years to go with SBS. So once the uh, once the contract ends, uh, we're going to put it as a you know open for public uh, education in Nigeria. 
I think I stop it here, Sharon, and I'm yeah, that'd, happy that'd be perfect because we have questions. some thank yous at the end, yeah. and we've got a few minutes for questions. So, um, so that's great. So, thank you very much, Willily. That was great. So interesting to hear about these very early connections. That certainly, as someone who grew up in Australia, never. We didn't hear anything about Aboriginal history, let alone these early connections. So it's really important to be bringing that to awareness. Um, have we got any questions? I'll take them. Either raise your hand and you can ask it. Rohan, have you got your hand is up? Silakan. Hello. Yes. Thank you, Bull Lily, for that Hi. presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, I've got one question for you. Um, I was just wondering if you've done any field work in the Arnhem Land um, region. And if you have, if you could maybe share some experiences of your time working with the community there or any um, anecdotes that um, the community there have told you about this um, relationship. Oh, yes. There, there are a lot of uh, stories, yeah, and very interesting stories. And of course, uh, there's uh, several uh, or few, <laughs> there are a couple of uh, uh, jokes <laughs> about uh, white Australians and indigenous communities and brown and yellow people that visiting uh, Australia. One uh, one uh, the one story that I been told yeah for you know repeated told when I conducted my first uh, field work for this film back then in uh, back in 2018. They keep telling me that. You know what? Your ancestors uh, introduced alcohol to us. <laughs> so it's uh, from the, the Dutch, Dutch liquor. Yeah? So they kept telling us about this notice stories about oh, they're, they're very, you know, they're very, uh, they're really afraid of their God. They pray because they're Muslim, but they also drink alcohols and it's a Dutch uh, alcohol <laughs> liquor. So that's one of the story that they keep telling us. And the other thing is uh, about uh, how uh, the uh, the perception about uh, indigenous community that been, you know, uh, portrayed as a passive community, uh, lack of knowledge, uh, you know, we, we measure them using our modern standards, yes. But in fact that from the Yongu people, they learned about how to respect the, uh, the matter of nature. Because when we went uh, for fishing, uh, we followed the, all the uh, rituals, yeah? They worship and asking uh, for permissions from the gods and saying that, well, okay, uh, we uh, already received this um, uh, signs from uh, the, the spirit saying that you are allowed to catch uh, two big fish today. Uh, so again, it's, about, it's all about, you know, you need to live, you have to live in a harmony with the nature side by side. Explo uh, exploitation is not in their concept of life. So it has to be something that balanced with what you need. You can actually have uh, try to find it in the, what God's offered to you in uh, your surrounding areas. This is also answer the one of the question about why not many Aboriginal people visiting uh, Makassar and other part of Southeast Asia. Because if you imagine that 300 or 400 years on regular basis, yeah, every November and December, Makassan camps, thousands, uh, 1,000 people at one point, yeah, they, uh, according to the record, uh, the historical re record, they see they, they saw 1,000 people come to uh, Einheim land. But after four months and preparing all, you know, preparing all the uh, commodities uh, and ready to return to Makassar, there's only one or two Aboriginal people that uh, been, you know, like we have this oral history that recorded that, you know, because they have this, um, the, the, the connection or context or relationships is quite equal, yeah, in a friendly uh, settings. So one or two Aboriginal people join the voyage back to Makassar not to stay there forever, but to learn uh, 
the, uh, the uh, technology, new technology, especially in uh, uh, in the boat building and then uh, trades. But when they returned to Marege or to, to back to Australia, the social status increased because uh, the community will respect this guy as a, someone that already hold new knowledge about new world outside there and uh the the other story that uh quite uh, yeah. interesting so, so yeah. i'm a mean moderator and i'm you know i'm, I'm conscious that <laughs> i hope this, a I hope this answer um, <laughs> and that we need to be finishing in one minute and we have to pass the photo dulo um but maybe i'll, I'll give you great. thank you for sharing to, to just answer this last question in about a minute. So here's a challenge for you, Dr. Lilly. Um, what does this history mean for Australia, Indonesia, bilateral relationship and our national identities? Um, it's very simple uh, answer from me. Yeah. So we established these relationships many hundred years ago. So it means we are not only the, the closest neighbors, but we are one of, uh, I think, the longest uh, mm -hmm. neighbor that have been working and established the connections from not only one or two generations, but I think it's the five to six generations. Oh, look at that. Well done. Well done. And we've got a minute. <laughs> to, <laughs> and, and as I've shown, rapid, mentioned, rapid but I do And I think a that's a, a wonderful answer to that question, that the connections between Australia and Indonesia didn't, you know, it didn't start with the white folk. There was a whole lot of stuff happening between Australia and Indonesia long before. Uh, I think I've got a misunderstanding about the time here because my invitation says that it's two hour event. <laughs> Sorry oh. about that. Gosh, no, 8.10, eight, we're finishing, end, closing. Thank the speakers, give vouchers, tell them about tomorrow night. I'll be yeah, here, I hope you all get I on haven't the jungle that. workshop. And before we head off, could I get a, a group photo? Yeah. So if, you've, um, if you feel comfortable, sorry, please turn sorry. on your camera. <laughs> and it's perfectly fine if you're not comfortable turning on your camera. Um, we'll give everyone a minute to, to, to do that. And I'll take beautiful. the screenshot. Yeah. Look beautiful. <laughs> You're always beautiful, Lily. Uh, You've got a lovely your hair, you need to. And okay, is that everyone who wants to turn on the cameras? Okay, Melissa's got hairs on. Um, all right, okay, I'm going to start. Um, okay, I'll count down from five to so five, four, three, two. Great, and I might take one more just in case. So three, two, one. Perfect.